And what about uh, the effects of a single seizure versus continuing seizure? In this study, we wanted to know when we looked at uh, di newly diagnosed patients, what was the incidence of psychological consequences? And if you look at uh, anxiety, for example, if you have a, a single seizure, there's about 9% of people were likely to be clinically anxious and that increased by threefold to 27%. And depression, twice as many people if they had continuing seizures and self-esteem, didn't really make any difference. And stigma increased by fourfold and seizure worry increased by twice. So the seizures themselves are triggers for psychosocial consequences. Next slide, please. What about the social consequences of this condition? Next slide. So we asked people, with epilepsy in their families to tell us about the impact of uncontrolled seizures. And we asked them to say how much their epilepsy and its treatment affected um, the many aspects of their day-to-day -day functioning. And we looked at that in relation to seizure activity. So if you had a, a, a seizure in the last month, you were three times more likely to say that it had a negative impact on your relationship with family, three times more likely to say that it impacted on your social activity, three times more likely to say that it was gonna affect your ability to work, your overall health, your relationship with friends, and your plans for the future and your overall standing of living. So this is a condition that just simply doesn't come um, and isn't parceled by just seizures, the consequences of it are quite significant, particularly if you go on to have continued seizures. And in the management of epilepsy, we have to think beyond just simply thinking about the seizures, but we have to understand the impact of those seizures, um, particularly if they continue. Next slide, please. So epilepsy is a stigmatizing condition. I've worked in this field for nearly 30 years. And has there been improvements in people's understanding of the condition and the level of stigma? Yes. Has it been dramatic? No. This, was a, uh, this slide represents three different uh, surveys. The first one is uh, The Independent in Ireland. This is an article that was published uh, on the 26th of May, 2013, which is only eight years ago. And they asked um, 20,000 young people in a survey whether they would date a person with epilepsy. And it was ridiculous. More than half of them said no. And more than half of them said that it would be stigmatizing um, to have a, a date with somebody with epilepsy. And they recognized that epilepsy itself was a stigmatizing condition. And that for me is sad because it tells me about the fact that progress has been made, but it is slow and it's incremental. And in a survey done by Austin et al in the US, 40% of teenagers said they were not sure whether people with epilepsy were dangerous or not. A third said they would only consider dating now, a third had said that only a third said they would only be dating, would only consider dating a person with epilepsy, whereas two thirds said they wouldn't. And 75% of those surveyed said that if you had epilepsy, you were more likely to be bullied or picked on by their peers. And in a study published in the UK in 2006, there were concerns that seizures led to social avoidance among peers. So the story still remains in terms of epilepsy as a stigmatizing condition per se. And that means that uh, organizations like the IBE and the ILA have a significant amount of work to do um, in relation to taking a much more wider impact on, on uh, understanding epilepsy and its treatment. Next slide, please. 
And of course, epilepsy is a condition that's associated with neuropsychological consequences. Next slide. This was a, a study I did of uh, just under a thousand people across Europe and asking them, well, how does epilepsy uh, affect the way that you cognitively uh, react? And you can see that approximately a third to two thirds of people said that it affects very clearly aspects of their day-to-day -day function, including forgetting people's names, following instructions, ability to do mathematics, remembering telephone numbers, learning something new, and slowing thought process down and producing mental and physical fatigue. So it's not a harmless condition. It's a condition that is associated with cognitive impairment. Now, of course, every person with epilepsy is different, and some people will have significantly intact cognitive functioning, where others may be severely compromised. And we can't predict terribly well who that individual is going to be, who does well and who doesn't. Next slide, please. So I asked people to talk about the consequences of their epilepsy and its treatment on cognitive functioning. And many said that there was no doubt about it in their minds that taking anti-epileptic medication produced cognitive effects, particularly memory loss, or it produces effects where they feel tired, confused, and slow, or as a consequence of the epilepsy as treatment, they find it difficult to speak in public or have difficulty finding the words they want to use. And of course, people associate it, the medication with uh, cognitive suppression, even when perhaps the seizures themselves are making a significant impact. Next slide. So we have this condition, which is not just about seizure activity. It is, goes well beyond that, and it affects people in almost all aspects of their lives. And so when we think about the management of this condition, yes, it's important to prescribe anti-epileptic medication to stop the seizures, but that doesn't resolve all of the difficulties. And there are these very clear psychosocial consequences that we need to address. And so what are the treatment options available for psychosocial consequences? Well, there's individual therapy, there's group therapy, there's now a internet programs, there are self-management programs, and of course, there are epilepsy support organizations, and there are complementary therapies, and there are folk medicine, and their pharmaceutical therapy and surgical treatment. And we have to decide how can we provide this level of service to as many people as possible across the globe, given the limited resources that already exist, even simply prescribing medication. And that's a, a challenge for the IBE. And so in this afternoon session, what I want to do is to ask our panel of distinguished speakers to talk about their experiences of providing psychosocial treatment. And at least we then have a platform for considering how we might move forward um, with management of this condition from a psychological or neuropsychological or social perspective. So I want to start off by uh, introducing um, the uh, first speaker. And the first speaker is uh, Dr. Nuran Idemia, who is a psychologist and an associate professor uh, in Turkey. I I've known her for more than 20 years. She served uh, on the epilepsy research group in Liverpool uh, with Professor Jacoby and I, and did her PhD on understanding the stigma of epilepsy. And she's worked on a number of studies uh, in Turkey, China and Vietnam, looking at knowledge and understanding of epilepsy and stigma associated with epilepsy. And Nuran has kindly agreed to talk to her, to us about her experience of providing psychological services in Turkey. Um, I'd like to present Nuran Idemir. Hello. 
My name is uh, Nuran Aydemir. Um, in this presentation, I would like to speak about uh, the psychosocial impact of epilepsy on Turkish individuals with epilepsy. And in order to do this, I would like to share my um, slides with you. Okay. Before we start to the psychosocial impacts, I would like to give you some information about the numbers um, in terms of the prevalence of epilepsy. It is approximately 10 to 6 uh, people in 1,000. And this prevalence is not so different than the prevalence of epilepsy in developed countries. And then uh, I would like to say a little bit about the word that we use uh, for epilepsy in Turkish. Um, this word is Sara. It is actually not a Turkish origin word, it's Arabic. It means a staggering or holding condition. And unfortunately, uh, this word has a um, highly negative connotation in the language. For example, if a person has problem in walking or has a shaky hand um, in daily life, we call it, do not act like you have Sara. Um, so in every interaction that I have with patients, I prefer to use the word epilepsy instead of Sara, because Sara is highly negatively connotated. Um, but epilepsy is quite neutral. It means nothing to an ordinary church person. Um, so I would like to create the illness called missions from a much more natural ground than a negative one. Um, then I would like to give you some information about the familiarity knowledge of the attitudes toward epilepsy in Turkey from a lay person's perspective, because when we understand this one, we could also understand what um, Turkish individuals with epilepsy are dealing with. So let's go. This data is collected from more than 1,300 adult individuals, uh, Turkish individuals. They live in mostly Istanbul and Izmir. Uh, I prefer the cities mostly because I have access to the cities and also they are one of the two most popular cities in Turkey and have also high internal immigration rates. Uh, when we look at the familiarity um, items, we can see that almost three out of four heard about it, let's say, more than a quarter read about it, let's say, and approximately half know someone with it, let's say. But when we look at the knowledge, we see that um, very few individuals, approximately 24%, uh, had high knowledge about epilepsy. Most people had uh, moderate knowledge. 56% uh, had uh, 7 to 11 correct answers in the scale, which has uh, 16 items in total. Then I would like to um, give you some information about the least known issues from Turkish public related to epilepsy. Uh, the least known one is that irregular Turkish individuals do not know that brain surgery can be a treatment, an option for treatment to cure epilepsy. And um, very few people know that uh, epilepsy has many different types because uh, for a regular Turkish person, uh, epileptic se uh, seizure equates to tonic seizure. And parallel to this finding, they also do not have awareness about the absence seizures. And the other issue is related with uh, appropriate seizure intervention methods. Um, this one, for example, uh, giving a person an onion to smell is quite cultural, um, culture specific. Um, even in a very busy highway, I see with my own eyes that they can find an onion and <laughs> give it to a person who is having a seizure. It is actually unbelievable. Um, and also uh, spilling water to uh, the patient's place to stop a seizure is also a common seizure intervention method, which is also quite wrong. And so when you look at these findings, we can see that they mostly need um, appropriate knowledge about seizure intervention methods and also about uh, different types of epilepsy. 
uh, when we look at the attitude, we see that um, contrary to the knowledge, the Turkish people's attitude is much more close to the positive side. Um, the maximum score was 70 in the scale and the mean was uh, 56. But there's a but. Of course, there's a but. When we look at in detail that the answers was that was given by the participants, we see that, for example, in an item, would you date with someone who has epilepsy? The most common answer is, I have no idea. Or would you object to the marriage of your child with someone who has epilepsy? Again, the most common answer is, I have no idea. Or I would, would you marry with someone who has epilepsy? Again, the most common answer is, I have no idea. But when you change the question, for example, would you feel uncomfortable to work with someone with epilepsy? Now, Turkish people's mind become much more clearer and they say, no, I don't mind. Uh, when we combine these findings, actually we can see that Turkish people do not mind about being a friend or being a coworker or being a neighbor with someone who is epilepsy, but they do have hesitations to be a relative, specifically a blood relative to a person with epilepsy. So for an average Turk, um, it is not a problem to put a person with epilepsy in the outer circle, but they are reluctant to put this person in their inner circle. Now, I would like to mention about the psychosocial effects of epilepsy from the patient's side. Uh, this is quite familiar. Um, the marriage rates and related to this, of course, the fertility rates are quite low when we compare it with the control participants. Also, the employment ratio is low when we compare it with the control participants in the epilepsy group. But an interesting part is there is no difference in education between epilepsy and uh, control groups. So the, um, the underemployment or unemployment or low marriage rates are not related with their level of education. Other factors actually seem to be responsible for this. Then let's see the depression ratio. Um, usually I study on uh, patients who has um, drug um, resistant epilepsy. So in this group, depression is higher. It's approximately 30%. But in a much more recent study from Turkey, um, the group is much more, more homogeneous. And they found that before COVID, it was 17%. And after COVID, it, was, it increased to 23%. So we can see that it is much more higher in um, seizure, um, in resistant seizures, drug resistant seizures, but lower in um, other groups of epilepsy, but still high actually. Um, in this study, uh, I asked individuals with epilepsy open-ended questions, and they answered again open-endedly uh, about their most reported concerns, affected life domains, and restrictions caused by epilepsy. And the most reported concerns are related with having a seizure um, outside home, um, because they have problems about um, what is going to happen to them, um, what kind of seizure intervention they are going to receive, or whether they are going to suffer from an accident or not. And also they have problems about having children and ambiguity of future use of AEDs and being a burden to others. And also um, the negative consequences and independence is commonly reported. Uh, affected life domains is much more related to work, education, family life. Again, personal dependence. Again, um, social physical activities. Cognitive is much more related with forgetfulness. They report uh, memory problems psychological well-being, romantic relations. And in, at the end of the list, they stated driving. And when you ask only the restrictions, they stated driving in the first, at the first, because they know legally they do not supposed to drive. Uh, but uh, in Turkey, especially in big cities, the public transportation is better, it is much more convenient, it is much more cheaper. So actually, people with epilepsy do not suffer from issues related with driving. Uh, in restrictions also, they um, report social physical activities and independence, and also education work life. 
But when you look at the three domains, the only common issue that they stated is um, their constant emphasis on independence. Um, actually, it was also something that we see in their regular visits to hospital. Um, it is not uncommon to see a 45 year old patient to come to their regular um, visit, neurological visit with their mom, father, um, pose, children. It was like a family visit actually. And when we asked them, is it valid for every condition? They always say, yes, I can't do anything alone. They always give someone to accompany me whenever I, wherever I go. And then we develop a scale. Um, to see uh, how much overprotection they perceive. And these are, by the way, adult patients. 50% uh, of the patients reported perceived high uh, perceived overprotection. And although families have good deeds, of course, while they're doing these overprotection behaviors, but the consequences in the long run, long run are quite um, detrimental. Um, because this overprotection, they can't develop um, social skills, they can't develop uh, social networks, and this also limits their opportunities to uh, find a romantic partner or job opportunities or have necessary social skills to survive alone in a society. So in the long run, actually, um, overprotection should be handled carefully in Turkish culture. And based on the open-ended answers that I presented a few slides ago, we developed an epilepsy concern scale and applied it in 200 adult individuals with epilepsy. And we found that 48% uh, of the participants reported high concerns related to feature and occupation. And 49% reported high concerns related with social life. They have concerns because they do not have skills actually to survive in these conditions actually uh, in real life. So the concerns are actually related to the lack of knowledge or lack of experience, by the way. And also they have concerns related to marriage and having children. So when we look this um, in general, we see that they have um, concerns related to um, most domains of the life. Another issue is that we see commonly is concealment of epilepsy. In this study, we compared epilepsy and migraine because migraine is also an illness which has a neurological manifestations. It's also an episodic illness. And I would like to compare something which is close to epilepsy. So the uh, differences could relate much more with the uh, epilepsy itself um, when you compare it to closer illness. So I asked patients, have you ever concealed your illness? And if yes, for how long? As you can see, none of the migraine patients said yes. And approximately 40% of the patients with epilepsy said, yes, I did or I still do. And then I asked them for how long? And this is, I think, the interesting part. 31% stated that I concealed it within the first few years after the diagnosis. But 69% stated that I still conceal it. So actually this shows us that it is not an initial reaction to the diagnosis of epilepsy. It is a long-term strategy. And when we asked the reasons, why do you conceal it? They again gave us open-end answers and we then classified the most common reasons are felt stigma, not an active one. Um, then we develop a concept of lapses scale to see the extension of the problem. And we see that approximately 50% of the patients highly conceal their epilepsy in different social contexts, such as they conceal it from um, not close relatives, friends, co-workers, um, romantic partners. And also another study from Turkey uh, support this finding. They found that uh, approximately 37% of the participants do not disclose their epilepsy to their partner prior to marriage, do not disclose it uh, approximately 
do not disclose it at work and 48% do not disclose it at school. So they, these findings also show us that they also uh, have a huge anxiety to be caught uh, if they have a seizure in public because they conceal it widely. And it's also quite interesting. Um, we compared again with migraine and epilepsy, and we asked them, "Have you ever applied um, um, spiritual or traditional healing methods?" Which is quite common in epilepsy and therapy. This has a long historical, cultural background, and very few, approximately ten percent of the migraine patients said yes, and close to sixty uh, percent of the participants in the epilepsy group said yes. So it is um, six times higher in patients with epilepsy. And the methods that they apply is also quite different. For example, migraine patients mostly use bioenergy or acupuncture, while patients with epilepsy use much more spiritual methods such as um, lead um, spelling or lead costume, sorry, or carrying a muska um, or going to a hoja. Uh, so the methods are also quite different. Then I would like to mention about the stigma. And uh, this is, uh, in our first studies, we use Jake Alisa's um, health stigma scale, which has three items. And it is commonly used in the area, in different cultures also. And this is a Turkish finding with other um, finds from different countries. And as you can see, the, the moderate stigma is actually not high in Turkish group, uh, but high stigma, which report that, which means that you've got three, uh, the maximum score in the scale, um, is higher in Turkish group compared to Croatian. Unfortunately, not all the studies report the high level stigma. And but it is still low when we compare when we compare with our observance in real life with the patients, then we develop our own scale because um, stigma is something culturally constructed. So it is expected to show huge variances from culture to culture. And when we apply our own scale, we see that 46% of the patients report felt stigma, high felt stigma, which is also um, quite, um, parallel to other findings from Turkey. Then uh, we would like to um, explain the variants, the variables that explain the felt stigma. In order to do this, we um, did a regression analysis and we found that concealment behavior and having high concerns like social life and future occupation explained 64% of the total variance in felt stigma. Um, Interestingly, contrary to our expectation, all protection do not contribute to felt stigma. Again, I think it is probably related with the Turkish culture, because all protection is something that we socially accept, expect if there is an illness, and maybe the lack of it could be uh, could cause some um, negative effects. This is a different study, actually. Um, so, if we do not have the luxury to apply a scale. Even by asking very simple to very simple questions such as have you ever disclosed your consular epilepsy or um, what kind of concerns do you have while you are living with epilepsy could um, give us an opportunity to estimate the felt stigma um, in that particular person with epilepsy. So thanks for your attention. Um, this is my presentation. I think at the end of the session, we will answer your uh, questions. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I mean, it, it, you're clearly delivering a message that um, we have to think about the management of epilepsy from a very much a culturally specific, and that one uh, size does not fit all. So what you go, so what type of program that you might want to uh, roll out in Turkey is going to be very different from other, uh, other areas uh, of the world. And that's going to make it a real challenge to, to try and think about 
what sort of programs we can universally manage uh, to help people with epilepsy. And uh, on that basis, I'd really like to go on to the, the second speaker, um, who is somebody I've known for many years. Um, professor Doris is a professor of clinical neuropsychology. He has worked uh, in the field of epilepsy for at least 25 years. He's regarded as the leading expert in pediatric clinical neuropsychology in the UK. But more importantly, he's got a program of work that's looked at how you get children to self-manage with their epilepsy. And that's an area that perhaps deserves a lot more of our attention and, constant and, and uh, focus. So uh, it's with great pleasure I ask Professor Doris to talk about his experiences of providing uh, self-management programs to children with epilepsy uh, in Scotland. Hello, my name is Liam Doris. I'm a professor of paediatric neuropsychology working here in Glasgow in Scotland. And today I'll be speaking about our experiences of developing psychosocial interventions for young people with epilepsy. And before I start, I'd like to thank the IBE for giving me this chance to speak about our work and also to thank Gus Baker in particular, both for the invitation and also in regards to his leadership in psychosocial epilepsy over many years. Now, this audience will be aware that young people with epilepsy are at increased risk of mental health difficulties, um, both in terms of their, their adolescence, but also in their lifespan risk of developing more significant mental health difficulties. And we know that adolescents with epilepsy have much higher levels of, of mood disturbance and particularly anxiety than those without epilepsy. And what we see in clinic often are young people whose mental health needs um, are not um, so significant that they would have help from child and adolescent mental health services, or indeed in particular support and education, but who have significant anxieties and worries that might um, make them socially anxious, may impact on their um, friendships and on their willingness to participate in normal community activities. We've also, we also know from previous studies that having low levels of epilepsy knowledge has also been one of the factors that um, links with this higher level of anxiety and again impacts on, on social outcomes. And many of us have become interested in thinking of what kinds of early interventions we might develop that might impact on that, that might make young people a bit more confident, a bit more engaged, um, a bit more willing to discuss with friends uh, any concerns they have and to participate. And we would hope that by using these approaches, we might then impact on the later development of more severe difficulties. So as with many other centres, um, it's quite common to run teenage epilepsy clinics, usually delivered by specialist nurses. And we um, built on that in Glasgow to develop a range of qualitative focus group studies where we really wanted to drill down a bit in terms of the everyday experiences, thoughts and concerns that young people had growing up in the context of, of having epilepsy. And we ran these both with young children and with teenagers. And this was really helpful um, and very instructive to us in terms of thinking about both epilepsy related issues, but also just general developmental concerns and thinking about the points at which we might intervene to help um, young kids just to have that confidence to discuss any, any worries and, and know how to um, stay involved with everyday activities. So um, we've, we've developed um, this work in various ways. We've developed a quality of life measure, the GOSYP, which is the Glasgow Epilepsy Outcome Scale for young people, which again is useful in clinic just in terms of mapping um, the experiences and concerns young people have. And we've also used a lot of the themes to develop um, a group intervention, which is the main thing we'll, we'll discuss today. So we've moved from the, the, the teenage clinic in, informed by focus group studies to then develop a pilot um, group intervention, which we then refined over a few years, both using the, the bottom up approach of the qualitative studies. So we're, we're working from the, the themes expressed by young people but also then uh, had advice from an expert reference panel of psychologists, nurses, and neurologists working um, in, in epilepsy, 
just to develop a really refined um, model and we've produced a, a manualized six session psychosocial intervention which we've called the PI study which is just, just the psychosocial intervention for epilepsy and that's the main thing we're going to look at. So this was an exploratory RCT manual based psychosocial group intervention and we published this in Epilepsy and Behaviour in 2017 for those of you who are, who are interested. So our aims were to look at the preliminary effectiveness of running a psychosocial intervention and we used outcome measures looking at quality of life, mood, uh, knowledge and self-management of epilepsy as well as a range of measures looking at the feasibility of running the intervention. So amongst the screening measures we used the Beck Depression Inventory and the Beck Anxiety Inventory as well as a range of demographic um, measures and the formal measures were the PIED uh, which looks at um, mood, the PEDSQL which is a well-known quality of life measure, the GOSYP and the Epilepsy Knowledge Profile and then the Seizure Self-Efficacy Scale for Children and the Brief Illness Representations Questionnaire as well as a range of evaluation measures looking at the experience and acceptability of the actual intervention. In terms of inclusion criteria, so we, we had to have a diagnosis of epilepsy of at least six months duration, age between 12 and 17 years, and to have uh, what we've pragmatically called a reasonable level of expressive and receptive English language ability, just so you can fully participate and contribute to the group process. And also that you had to be in mainstream schooling. So on this occasion, we did exclude those um, with a diagnosis of learning disability or those who attended the special school. Now, we do feel that the PI intervention could easily be amended um, for that group um, with, with more significant cognitive difficulties, um, but we've not gone on to do that so far. We also excluded those with more complex mental health issues or if you had non-epileptic seizures in the absence of having epileptic seizures and also those whose epilepsy has occurred in the context of postnatally acquired structural lesions, immune mediated disorders or metabolic disorders. So in terms of who our participants were, so we, we uh, included 83 participants with a mean age of 14 years, predominantly female, 50 female and 33 male, all attending mainstream school, a third of whom had some educational support um, and the vast majority had no mental health support. But 8% did attend CAMS, almost 5% a school counsellor and 3% attended specialist services such as neuropsychology. And the mean time since diagnosis, diagnosis of uh, five and a half years. In terms of the type of epilepsy, and predominantly, our participants had one of the generalised genetic epilepsies, whilst the third also had a focal epilepsy. So, in terms of the design of our study, it was a waiting list control design. So you're randomised um, in terms of uh, sex and age into either a treatment or a control condition. So both, both um, groups did receive the intervention but the control condition had to wait three months in order to start their intervention. So both groups complete baseline measures. Then group one receives the six week intervention and group two has to wait three months. And then measures are also completed at the end of the intervention um, at, at six weeks, again at three months and at six months follow up. In terms of the, the content, briefly, the first three sessions really were um, based on increasing uh, skills and understanding your own seizure condition, developing skills to talk about that, both with your, your friends, with your class, um, with doctors and nurses, and within your family. And we used um, a range of role play, video vignettes, and group discussion, just to think about how each individual could develop uh, language that they were comfortable with um, and, and thinking about what they might want to change, whether that was speaking to a best friend, being more involved in a medical consultation, but just thinking how to um, take a bit more um, control and feel a bit more autonomy about managing your own condition. 
We then moved um, through through those tasks and towards a kind of problem solving approach to um, managing your own condition, but then to a more classic mental health um, uh, component using CBT techniques to manage difficult thoughts and feelings, and then also looking at mindfulness and relaxation techniques, again, just to manage low levels of, of, of anxiety and, and mood-related difficulty. So in terms of the results on effectiveness, uh, I should have said earlier that in terms of the BAI and B, uh, BDI, so those are the anxiety and depression inventories, we had a very low level um, of, of mental health difficulties. This was a group who didn't have uh, mental health disorder, they were just a group who were slightly anxious. So in that sense, the, there was no improvement in mood, but that's because the group were not particularly depressed anyway. Similarly, there was no improvement in quality of life, and we'll talk about that at the end. But the big, the big difference was in terms of epilepsy knowledge. So the, the at three months follow up, the intervention group uh, knew significantly more about epilepsy than the control group. So an improvement in epilepsy knowledge. And the other big uh, change was confidence talking to peers about epilepsy. So again, a highly significant improvement uh, at, at three month outcome. So at three months post-intervention, the treatment group of 40 participants was compared with the waiting list control of 43 participants. And there was a significant increase in epilepsy knowledge, which was not only sustained, but increased um, at six months. So really what we found is that um, after the intervention, people knew more about epilepsy, but they knew even more at three months and even more at six months. So we had kind of turned people into self-guided self learners. So we started them on a journey and given them some skills where they, they continued to learn about the condition and continued to increase the knowledge about, their own, about having epilepsy. And also the participants were significantly more confident in speaking to others. But none of the mood or quality of life measures reached significance. I think the quality of life issue may be around the fact that PI is a brief intervention. It's six two-hour sessions using a kind of skills-based approach to coping with with um, communication challenges and uh, anxiety and mood issues, but it's probably not got the kind of um, depth or extent of an intervention that would make a huge difference in quality of life, which I suspect requires um, you know, a significant change in your life opportunities or your relationships. In terms of feasibility, um, the young people, um, the, the, the most um, important thing they said was learning about their epilepsy. So almost half of them said that was the most important aspect of attending the groups. Second important thing was learning to cope with difficult feelings, 29%, and then meeting others with epilepsy at 22%. But crucially, 93% said they would recommend the group to others. It's quite a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and other young person feedback, 75% thought mindfulness was helpful and the same amount wanted to learn more about that. I think we would probably include a, a larger mindfulness component, component in the future. Some of those uh, comments were, it was helpful um, to me because it helps me to feel relaxed. It takes the stress and depression away. Another person said, mindfulness is very helpful. It helped me to let go of my negative thoughts. I've never realized everything I have in the present moment, which is surprisingly large, and I will keep practicing mindfulness. And someone else said it was very helpful in every aspect of my life, not just epilepsy. I think that was um, something that was really crucial from, from the, the group was that whilst there was a lot of content focused on the condition of having epilepsy, more of it was really just around um, developmental issues and growing up with having a chronic condition in the background, but just learning some general life skills which seemed to really, really help um, the young people. In terms of um, formal feedback then, so it was very highly rated in terms of organisation, the materials. I should say that we, the, as well as a, a manual um, for, the, for the PI intervention with all the content for, um, for those providing the intervention, the participants also received a handbook and the, the content in the handbook matched quite well with the, the, um, the instructor's uh, manual. 
Uh, people found the group activities helpful and rated the facilitators uh, highly as well. Just a few more comments. So one young person said it was lovely to get the chance to meet people. Sorry, it's a technical thing, with similar experiences to myself. It made me feel less alone, more understood and happier. I enjoyed my time, learned a lot about my condition, and I also met others like me. I will miss the people. It was great because I made new friends. And it helped me correct rumours about epilepsy and I learned more about it. So caregivers were also positive. Um, one parent said, by attending these meetings, our child has opened up about their condition. She has also learned more about her condition and has more confidence asking questions in clinic. A second parent said, hasn't changed anything with my child's seizures, but has definitely helped my child's confidence. Previous to this course, none of his peers knew of his seizures, but after only two sessions, he had confidence to tell some of them. It has helped him see that he isn't the only one with seizures and he can share how he feels. He has made friends he will keep in contact with, and this course has been incredibly valuable and we're very grateful to be involved. And a third parent said, the Pi group has been good for him to interact with other teenagers and going through similar worries to his own. He's even signed up for swimming lessons and looks forward to getting out more. So crucially, the participants uh, were learning skills, but then putting them into practice in terms of the goals that they had. So they were telling their friends, they were signing up to more ordinary activities and really just being out there in the community. So that was, that was the real goal was that people could know a bit more about their condition, could communicate with friends, with teachers and with others, and were just getting a bit more involved in, in the opportunities that they, that they had in their lives. Feasibility then, so reasonably good um, uh, completion rates. So in group one, we had a 79% um, completion rate. Group two was a bit lower at 68%. And we, we would assume um, because there was a much longer wait between being inducted into the study and receiving the intervention, but really quite good feasibility and acceptability ratings. So our conclusions from this um, brief intervention were that PI was an effective inter intervention to increase epilepsy knowledge and that that knowledge continued to increase, suggesting that people, once they had learned the, those skills, continued to find out for themselves, continued to ask questions at clinic and continued to read about their condition. Also, that people were significantly more confident to talk about having epilepsy with their peers. Um, as, this, as our participants had a low incidence of mental health problems, there was no impact from PI on improving mental health, but as I said, that could probably be developed um, with further sessions as an add-on for, for um, groups who were higher on mental health difficulty. We didn't find any impact on quality of life, but feasibility was high, and we feel that PI could, with modification, become part of the normal care pathway for young people with epilepsy. And it's worth saying that this is this is a very good use of uh, resource. So I think the epilepsy nurses thought this was a very good way to um, focus uh, and use the structure in terms of their teenage clinics uh, and in, in terms of their, their psychosocial role. And the clinical psychologist also felt it was a very good use uh, um, of their time in relation to providing an early intervention. So the study has um, gone on. So several of the, the seven centres that ran PI they have continued to use that within their care pathway. But also our colleagues in Edinburgh have also added PI to a development that they have been working on over the past five years called PAVES, which is Psychology Adding Value Epilepsy Screening. So it's a mental health triage tool where um, young people attending a neurology clinic as part of their epilepsy care uh, complete an SDQ, so that's a Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire via uh, an online portal. So it's described as a kind of hands-free psychology screening for mental health vulnerabilities and includes a, a kind of early stepped intervention model. And let's just quick look at what that is. So they use a traffic light system. So from the SDQ score, if it's a low score, you're just into the green zone, so you don't really need any intervention. 
intermediate scores are in the AMBER category and then there's a kind of stepped care approach where you can be referred to uh, a charity and in, in, in our context it's Epilepsy Scotland is the charity for further support or to a self-management group information sent relevant self-help materials there are parent workshops and a drop-in center and then for those scoring uh, in the red domain so higher again there can be the similar disposals but they will also offer the pie intervention for those who aren't um, necessarily uh, would be able to be sent to cams but who do need some input so so the pie intervention i guess is the the kind of top of their care pathway and that's where there's that's the kind of highest intensity and in terms of the SDQ ratings, this is 232 prior to the pandemic. If we, if we compare the number in the red zones, these are high SDQ ratings. We see that 38% score in this red category compared to only 5% in terms of the general population and a further 50% in the amber. So we can see here that more than half of the children attending neurology outpatient clinics are either in the amber or red zones in terms of and their SDQ scores or their or early emerging mental health issues. And so to date, the PAVES project has been very successful and it's actually led to a 62% decrease in, rep in referrals of young people with epilepsy to CAMS from neurology clinics. So it's been an exceptionally efficient and effective use um, of time. So just to finish, in terms of the Scottish experience, I'll just point to a few publications. One is the, the PI study, which we've talked about, and please feel free to get in touch with me about that. Also a recent publication uh, on PAVES, so again, that um, is worth looking at. We also published a systematic review looking at psychosocial interventions for young people with epilepsy. And the other strand that we've not talked about today is about um, learning. So we published the first um, accelerated forgetting study in children a number of years ago. And that's also become quite um, well received within education and has led to a different approach to the, the education of young people with epilepsy in Scotland. Um, but that's another day. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks to the IBE and I'll be very happy to take questions. Many thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Liam, for that excellent presentation, which I'm sure has left all the audience thinking about why aren't we providing this sort of service in our own country or, or our own hospitals? And uh, how can we roll out something like that uh, for children with epilepsy? Because it looks absolutely spot on for meeting the needs of uh, children and their and their families and anything that's going to empower them to manage their condition and be an advocate for, for epilepsy it has got to be good news for them and for their family. Let's carry on with this story because next speaker is uh, from Mauritius, it's Davisha Dasan, and she's going to talk to us about uh, her experience of uh, providing services in Mauritius. Uh, her background is as an organisational psychologist who has been um, spending a significant time helping and support people with mental health, and she has more recently moved into providing services for the Mauritius Epilepsy Organisation. So it's with great pleasure I ask her to present on her understanding and experience of um, providing services, psychosocial services for people in Mauritius. Thank you, Devisha. Hello everyone, I'm Devisha Dasmain from Mauritius. Thank you for having me here today. It's a real honor to be able to present for the IB Congress. So just a little introduction on me before we get started. I'm currently the mental wellness advisor at, uh, at a tertiary education institution in Mauritius. And at the same time, I'm a part-time psychologist at ADYCS Epilepsy Group, which is a non-governmental organization that caters for people with epilepsy in Mauritius. So the topic for today is going to be on psychological treatment of epilepsy and the Mauritius experience. So we we get started. So just a little overview of the situation here. We currently have, we currently believe to have 2% of the population suffering from epilepsy. So that amounts to 24,000 people 
approximately, but we do believe that this number is not quite accurate and that the number of cases are underreported because um, it could be because of stigma problems that we have. So people are, are quite hesitant to come and to uh, get themselves diagnosed, for example, uh, because uh, they look differently when it comes to having uh, living with epilepsy in Mauritius. So it's still a taboo that we are trying to fight every day. And um, how, how is it understood here? Again, like I said, like I mentioned, uh, the stigma is very much present. So we can see it in schools. So for example, when children having clinical and clinic seizures attending uh, schools and they have the seizures during classes, we can see that the, the little classmates would be a little bit curious about what's happening, maybe not really understanding as well of uh, what's happening to their classmate. And sometimes this can be a risk for more bullying and uh, the child uh, that suffers from epilepsy might not be able to deal with such burden and also affects the parents. At the same time, it affects the education of the child where sometimes parents remove the child from mainstream education so that um, they don't, they, they're not every day exposed to a stressful situation. And mostly because they cannot keep up as well with missing classes, the number of time they are absent from school actually makes them lose um, the academic schedule at the same time. So here in Mauritius, living with epilepsy is either something that people try to hide. So you won't necessarily, for example, there are situations where women tend to not say anything to, for example, they're getting married, right? They won't necessarily say it before getting married in case um, the family might not get them married to their son, for example. Or if they do get diagnosed, they'll easily get medication for it and not necessarily getting psychological or emotional support for um, the associated issues that people with epilepsy face. So um, unless they're presented with clear comorbid uh, psychological impairments, for example, um, clear signs of depression, that um, they won't be referred to, to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So the availability of psychological treatment in Mauritius. So the main uh, parts that uh, psychological treatment is offered is through public and private sectors. So in the, our public hospitals, it's mainly medication-based. So what happens is someone suffers from seizures, epileptic seizures, they go to a hospital and they'll be prescribed anti-epileptic drugs. And usually that will be quite it. So they'll have several appointments where, they, where they'll be given the drugs. Um, if they're working fine on next appointments, keep, like the doctors will try to give them other medication to decrease uh, frequency of seizures even more but it's rare that they will be automatically referred to mental health professionals. So like I mentioned before, unless the doctor sees a clear uh, psychological challenge, they will not be referred directly uh, to a mental health professional or even a psychological evaluation after this. Uh, which brings us to private institutions. So these are mainly people so the patient themselves take the initiative to go uh, seek an appointment with a mental health professional. And their assessments are a little more thorough. It's easier for um, the people to express themselves at the same time. The appointments will, the sessions actually will be longer as well. Th this mainly applies to private clinics or private uh, mental health practitioners themselves in their own private practice. We also have EDYCS epilepsy group, which I mentioned before. So the NGO and their work mainly uh, focuses on providing different types of support. So providing psychological support as well as medical support. So there's a doctor coming every uh, occasionally to, to, to give uh, 
medical treatment to the people living with epilepsy and also training workshops to educate both people, the patients actually uh, living with, with epilepsy, as well as family and uh, uh, teachers, so the whole population and educating them on what the disorder is about, uh, what to do uh, whenever they see someone having a seizure, for example, or the kind of help that they can bring to people living with epilepsy. So that's a little bit about how available um, psychological treatment is in Mauritius. So what the types of uh, psychological challenges that um, people with, living with epilepsy face is rather common, I think, uh, all around the world. So intellectual disabilities, this can be seen um, in schools mainly, so where ADHD learning difficulties is quite, um, comorbid with people suffering from epilepsy, um, also dyslexia and, and everything. Uh, anxiety and depression, cognitive disorders, behavioral issues, and something we see a lot of in the center is uh, family issues, family conflict, uh, situations where they, there are difficulties communicating with each other. Family members maybe not understanding the disorder um, itself and quite isolating the person living with epilepsy. And this creates even more stress for the person. So what kind of interventions do we provide when it comes to people uh, living with epilepsy? So right now, as, as, as of now, what uh, we've seen, the focus to treat uh, psychological issues is mainly psychosocial. So we offer more psychosocial support. So what that means is we tend to ask them to see, to look around them, like who supports them whenever um, they're having seizures, who is around uh, to, to support them during that time, um, what kind of prevention method they have to prevent them from falling down, you know, and having a good support system to have them deal with the seizure. So how are these functioning on, on a day-to-day -day basis? So it's really actually making sure that they're well cared for so that it decreases that stressful um, situation of dealing with epilepsy on your own, actually. So um, this is what we mainly focus on. So I would say the, the lacking here would be on the assessment methods, the neuropsychological side of the disorder where we do need a little more training maybe and uh, also assessment methods. Um, so when it comes to interventions uh, as a psychologist, what we do is of course, it, it will depend on the various situation. So each one's uh, problems are different, right? So the, the distress of one person could be different from someone else's distress. So uh, during the first session, we assess, uh, we take the history. So we assess a little bit um, the causes of them coming into counseling in the first place. So it's usually ranges from having difficulties accepting the disorder in the, in the first place. So um, it, and uh, as I mentioned, so maybe they could have uh, issues with low mood or anxiety or having conflictual relationships with the family members. The, the causes of them coming to cancer is very vast. But uh, so when we try to assess that at the beginning, it's easier for us to determine what kind of uh, intervention we'll use then. But mainly we, we had them a, a big part of, uh, of the first sessions, we might say, is having them understand their, their disorder, um, how it's interacting within their, their, their uh, uh, daily lives, and uh, having them accept the impacts and the consequences it has on their own lives. And also having giving them tools coping skills to deal with how people perceive them at the same time, because it can be very stressful to deal with uh, people's eyes on you. So the judgment that people have whenever you tell them, for example, that, okay, uh, they're suffering from epilepsy. So helping them in that way at the same time, 
Next, we also have, we also do a lot of talk therapy. So listening to them, being there um, to let them express themselves. So what we've noticed is sometimes people have difficulty finding people, others that would genuinely listen to them um, with their struggles, right? So being there in a non-judgmental manner is very important for people living with epilepsy. We also uh, give a lot of uh, relaxation techniques. So we teach them how to breathe properly whenever they're facing uh, an anxious moments. So different uh, breathing techniques that can calm them whenever thing, uh, emotions are getting a little too intense. Uh, progressive muscle relaxation if they feel tension in different parts of their body or after a seizure if they're still feeling the stress so being able to relax themselves afterwards we also do mindfulness training sessions to help them just really be able to take in whatever is around them and be mindful of, of um, what's happening to them every day and being able to not continually dwell on the negative aspects of the disorder because while the disorder is very much difficult, it's not like any disorder, yes, but the epilepsy is something that can happen anytime, right? Not everyone has uh, cues on when it's going to happen. So it, it, it can be quite hard for people to anticipate and which accentuates a little bit on the negative aspects of the, of, of the disorder. Uh, a, a huge part of psychological intervention is also family therapy. So we call in family members whenever we can see that there is a little conflict or maybe some family members are not really understanding how the person is living through um, the disorder, what we do is we call in everyone and we try to manage, to help them manage their relationships, to help them understand each other and be able to live properly um, in a supporting environment at home as well. So uh, when it comes to intervention, it really depends on the situation of the individual. And based on that, uh, we follow through with a proper treatment plan for each one of them. Uh, a huge part of uh, what we consider psychological intervention is psychoeducation. So we do believe that this is actually important to prevent further, deeper psychological challenges to happen afterwards. So it's better to educate and creating a supportive community and rather than having to treat um, more important, more serious conditions afterwards. So this HUD is mainly done by EDYCS epilepsy group. So what, what uh, we do is organize training workshops and this targets every level of, 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 the, of the society. So it goes from teachers, pre preschool teachers, uh, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, medical professionals, mental health professionals, civil society um, officers. So everyone from the public or private sectors, what we do is we organize workshops to um, it help educate them on what epilepsy is, how it affects people, and how, uh, for example, you could help if someone uh, with epilepsy is around you. So um, what, what this does is also decrease the stigma attached to the disorder because we tend to be scared of what we don't know, right? So if we don't know about something, we tend to be like, oh, um, maybe I'll stay away from this one. So it, it keeps the stigma growing whenever we do not talk about it. So what those workshops do is we initiate the conversation. So we get the conversation going so that we are able to decrease the whole taboo around, around epilepsy. And uh, if we know about something, we're less scared of it. And we can see that it, there's nothing to be scared about. We can actually help people uh, that are living with the, with the disorder in a better way and also um, avoid incidents where um, sometimes, for example, there are 
villages in, in Mauritius where sometimes beliefs that, for instance, putting a spoon uh, whenever someone is, uh, is having a seizure is going to help them not bite their tongue. But this could be actually dangerous. So educating people about those things could also prevent further incidents. But this is mainly for the medical part, which, in, which we also do, but for the psychological part, so educating them on comorbid disorders. So uh, how people with epilepsy are more prone to developing, for example, um, depression, anxiety, or um, uh, children living with epilepsy actually develop having comorbid learning difficulties or um, ADHD and so on. So educating them on all those little things through our workshops have proven to be a good way actually to educate everyone and at the same time decrease anxiety, um, sorry, stigma around the disorder. So we, I do believe that we have a long way to go when it comes to having a proper uh, structured psychological program when it comes to helping pe people with epilepsy. We're working very hard to provide, like we said, psychoeducational workshops that are helping, but we do have a lot of work to do when it comes to neuropsychological interventions. So getting our diagnostic um, methods, really assessing people from the beginning, their cognitive abilities and so on, and helping them developing proper plans to actually get them to develop, to work on skills that they can, and you know, actually be uh, able to function properly without major impairments, let's say, in the society. So it's certainly normal for people to struggle a little bit uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's quite unfair for um, people living with epilepsy to have so much burden to carry. All right, so this is all for me for today. Um, and if you have any questions after this presentation, please do not hesitate to send it to me via email. I'd be happy to get back to you. So thank you, everyone, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Devisha, for a, an excellent presentation. You can see from the presentations we've had so far, there are a number of common themes that are emerging and I certainly want to discuss them uh, after our fourth and final presentation. And the next presentation uh, is by uh, Rosemary Cabot. Um, she is a health scientist. She is the epilepsy program lead for CDC in the US. She has a master's degree in, uh, in public health and she's done some amazing uh, research on population studies uh, of people with epilepsy. Uh, and is a recognized uh, expert in the field of epilepsy self-management uh, and stigma. And she has supported a number of epilepsy organizations uh, by her participation on the professional advisory board. I've known uh, uh, Rosemary for probably more than 25 years. Um, and I've, I'm always, always uh, excited about listening to what she has to say. Um, it gives me great pleasure to ask uh, uh, Rosemary Cabo to uh, present. Greetings, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to join the International Bureau of Epilepsy Day session on psychological treatment and self-management of epilepsy, where I'll talk about the U.S. perspective on epilepsy self-management programs. So just a quick disclaimer that these are all primarily my opinions, not the official position of the US government. And for my talk today, I'm going to talk about a public health approach to self-management that we use here in the US. And so I will highlight our CDC epilepsy program self-management framework, including our efforts to systematically advance self-management research, to disseminate evidence-based programs, to support implementation research as well. I'm going to also briefly cover some lessons learned from other um, US national efforts on program dissemination. And I will wrap up with uh, some resources for providers and patients, as well as review some next steps that I think are needed. 
So CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion that houses our epilepsy program promotes chronic disease prevention through four strategies or domains. The first focuses on epidemiology and surveillance, so measuring how many people have chronic diseases and risk factors. The second domain focuses on environmental approaches. So this means improving environments to make it easier for people to make healthy choices. The third domain focuses on st strengthening healthcare systems to enhance screening, to diagnose diseases early and to keep people well. And the fourth domain focuses on linking clinical services with evidence-based community programs that help people prevent and manage their chronic diseases and conditions. So increasing the use of effective interventions such as chronic disease self-management programs, evidence-based chronic disease self-management programs, is a CDC recommended strategy to improve population health. So additionally, in public health, we intervene, of course, at population levels. So we talk about the management support as a population approach. And this means having a grouping of um, policies, programs, services, and structures that extend across multiple sectors to support individual chronic disease management. And this is important because this approach underlies our effort to foster epilepsy self-management support in the U.S. in a systematic way. And we are the only entity in the U.S. to do so at this time. And in part, this is why I'm primarily focusing on our work. So additionally, just to emphasize that the U.S. public health system supports chronic disease education broadly, I wanted to highlight some national objectives through our Healthy People initiative. And briefly, Healthy People is a uh, national health promotion agenda whose aim is to improve population health over each decade. And as you see here, Healthy People has included objectives to increase the number of adults who receive effective arthritis, diabetes, and asthma educational programs, including mo most recently an objective aimed at increasing um, self-management among those with chronic pain, given the burden of chronic pain in the population. So I think these objectives serve as a model for what I certainly hope we can achieve in epilepsy, and that is having support structures in place to deliver epilepsy self-management programs nationally, having national objectives and tracking systems in place to measure progress and impact over time. So developing programs to enhance self-management skills for those who can benefit. I mean, clearly we recognize that not everyone with epilepsy has the capacity um, or the ability to, to benefit from self-management program, programs, but for those who do, um, Again, developing those programs and connecting people with epilepsy to those programs are priorities for our epilepsy program at CDC. However, unlike uh, in diabetes, arthritis, uh, heart disease, asthma, and other chronic diseases in the US, little was known about effective epilepsy self-management strategies, effective programs, or ways to deliver these programs in the US. So for these reasons, CDC supported self-management research as far back as in 2002 um, as a fundamental first step of our epilepsy self-management support system framework that you see here. And the second step in the framework involves evaluation of self-management programs so that we can ensure that the programs are working as intended. The third step involves dissemination of findings and provider training opportunities with the epilepsy community. The fourth step involves supporting community-based pilots through various partnerships that I'll talk about in a moment. The fifth step involves continued evaluation of all of these efforts because, again, evaluation is so critical to all of our work. And finally, um, we have a need to support cost studies of these programs in the U.S. so that we can explore reimbursement uh, mechanisms to sustain these programs. So although CDC's Managing Epilepsy Well Network, or the MU Network as we like to call it, is now 14 years old, um, it certainly follows early promising research on self-management that we supported as one of uh, my first um, projects when I came to CDC as a behavioral scientist back in the early 2000s. And so the mission of the MU Network is to advance the science related to epilepsy self-management, 
by facilitating and implementing research, conducting research in collaboration with uh, community partners, and broadly disseminating the findings of that research with the epilepsy community. So this is essentially just a snapshot of our timeline and structure, including the specific awardees over time. And I think it nicely demonstrates CDC's commitment to this topic and how the program has grown and changed over the years. Whoops. And as noted, um, initial projects focused on research and program development to meet local interests and needs. So um, our teams tailored programs for specific subgroups based on local input. They tested those programs and again, disseminated those findings. And given some of the initial uh, promising efficacy results, we later supported replication studies and again, dissemination of uh, products as well as provider trainings. And our goal with the most recent funding cycle is to continue to expand the evidence for intervention effectiveness and to explore some implementation factors associated with both individual and institutional program adoption. So at this time, um, we have eight evidence-based programs that address different self-management domains that have been tested in uh, one or more uh, randomized controlled trials or RCTs. And I wanted to share an overview of at least six of our programs so that you get a general sense of their scope, their key domains, their components, the type of provider that's necessary to deliver them, the mode of delivery, and the program's duration. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna you know, review all of the details, um, but just as a quick example for um, hopscotch, targets people with epilepsy who obviously have memory problems. And key components include self-awareness training and use of memory strategies. The program can be delivered by different uh, licensed providers, as well as accredited um, community health workers. So the um, delivery includes two telehealth or in-person visits with the healthcare provider at the beginning to foster a personal relationship and also one at the end. But in between, um, most of the program content is delivered via telephone um, uh, by, the, by the trained hopscotch coach. And you see that um, the program lasts about eight weeks. And briefly, um, Mindset is um, different in scope. It's a tablet-based decision support tool that a patient completes in the doctor's office or ahead of time um, online. And it's been tested and evaluated and is now available for both English and Spanish speakers. And you get a sense of um, the scope uh, of, of PACES. So notably, uh, SMART's time and project uplift focus on addressing mental health needs of people with epilepsy. SMART is the most generic in scope, whereas both time and uplift are designed to help people with epilepsy and comorbid mental illness. And you see that they each have a group component, including having a trained peer who works with a licensed provider to deliver the intervention. So the bottom line is that uh, results from at least 15 randomized that assess different delivery modes by which the MUTE programs are delivered. Um, and that is by phone, in person, um, or in a group setting um, pre-pandemic that um, these uh, data demonstrate improvements in different outcomes, uh, including quality of life, uh, knowledge about um, epilepsy or uh, their, uh, depression or uh, another mental illness, self-management of one's disorder, self-efficacy, confidence to um, engage in self-management strategies, improvements in mood, uh, also including reductions in depression, as well as seizure frequency. Oops. So I also wanted to briefly note that we um, uh, have an integrated database led by Case Western Reserve University uh, in the MU network. And the database includes common data elements related to epilepsy self-management. At this time, the database includes pooled data from about 1,700 unique individuals with epilepsy from 19 studies, um, 16 of which are new network studies. 
And for those interested in learning more, here are some of the key studies describing the database architecture, common data elements, um, and some uh, aggregate outcomes. And here is one study from the aggregate database that nicely captures the impact of new network programs on depressive symptoms. And you can see by looking at the demographics that overall the new network sites are reaching diverse subgroups of people with epilepsy. And you see that um, in the figure that, uh, that displays outcomes from at least um, five new programs or five, from five new programs. Um, all of which were aimed at depression reduction and all used the PHQ-9 as a common outcome. And again, as you see in the figure, the program treatment groups had significantly greater reduction in depression compared to the controls um, at both visits two and three. So this um, uh, provides nice evidence uh, from a robust data set uh, or from a robust sample rather um, uh, regarding the, the effectiveness of these programs. So now I'm gonna shift gears to talk about dissemination and implementation of some community-based pilot interventions. And first, in order to understand what would, what would be needed for scaling up these programs and communities, we asked our colleagues um, at Emory University who developed Uplift um, we asked them to, dis to estimate dissemination costs, including both facilitation and delivery costs. So here we're looking at facilitation and program material costs, essentially. And you can see the breakdown of costs for different provider scenarios um, per participant hour. So the total cost to cover facilitators for one cohort is about $2,500. And the total cost to cover program materials, including developing manuals, copying, mailing material out to um, program participants, um, supporting the monthly uh, conference call or weekly conference call rather, um, that uh, those uh, total costs for about one cohort is about $360. $360. So total program implementation costs for Uplift are about $2,900 plus um, institutional overhead if there is any. So by 2016, with CDC support, the Epilepsy Foundation implemented eight pilots in the states and jurisdictions that you see here. And these were eight pilots for Project Uplift. And what did we learn from those um, initial dissemination efforts? We learned that most effective recruitment was done through existing one-on-one -on -one contacts, um, not marketing, not social media. Uh, we learned that the average retention was about 64%. The median was a little bit higher. Among those who completed the programs, depression decreased significantly across all sites with reductions in symptoms ranging from 34 to about 43%. Um, we heard that participants really liked sharing with one another. They liked learning the, the skills and they liked the program content um, and they appreciated the telephone delivery. Um, participants also gave us some helpful feedback. For example, um, they suggested that the program team give them reminders within 24 hours of the session, not just uh, two or three days before. And they wanted more time for discussion, which is certainly not a surprise. And we also heard that there, um, uh, some folks actually thought that Uplift would be useful for caregivers as well. So CDC and the Epilepsy Foundation have continued to partner to support more um, new network pilot implementation since 2013 so that we can get epilepsy self-management programs into communities and learn how to do that effectively. So this map shows not only epilepsy prevalence um, based on our 2015 data where essentially darker shades indicate higher epilepsy prevalence, but also you see locations of the different pilots by new program again over time. So I also wanted to take a moment to note that other groups uh, who serve people with epilepsy, such as a local county behavioral health agency in Ohio, um, and another epilepsy uh, organization, the Ohio Epilepsy Association, 
partnered to make another of the new network programs available um, for local county residents with epilepsy. So they were interested in uh, implementing time. And so our Case Western Reserve uh, University new network team worked with these groups to implement and evaluate what is now known as community time, C time for short. And essentially the data showed that C time was, was effective in reducing depressive symptoms and, high, and, they, and participants had high levels of um, satisfaction, over 90% rated it positively. So this study demonstrated that seat time could be successfully used in the community. And it's wonderful to see that um, this program was advertised um, uh, by the uh, local county behavioral health agency. So um, nonetheless, we still have work to do, uh, not only in the United States, but certainly in the field more broadly. As many of you no doubt are familiar, um, recent systematic reviews have pointed out that we have at best moderate quality evidence, and we certainly need more data to show that these programs work consistently as intended. But at least um, one of these reviews did highlight one of the new network studies as an example of a methodologically robust study. And as um, we all know, despite known limitations, um, it's important to note that given the need among people with epilepsy that we know um, and growing evidence that the ILAE uh, Psychology Task Force recommended that psychological, psychological interventions should be incorporated into comprehensive epilepsy care, and no doubt that's why we are all here. So I also wanted to briefly touch on limitations related to dissemination of epilepsy self-management programs. And here you see a map um, that is on the MU Network website that identifies states with open self-management programs. So uh, a provider or a person with epilepsy could go to the link and submit um, a referral for themselves or for a patient. But despite our efforts to raise visibility of these programs, general awareness of their availability is limited. So we do face challenges with recruitment and retention and therefore have limited reach. And the reach is so limited, in fact, that it's becoming hard to justify continuing to support this work. Um, and we know that certainly evaluation is hard for folks in the field, um, even though we try to make it as easy as possible with trainings and forms and guidance, it's just hard for people to um, follow up on and, and get us good evaluation data. And certainly funding is always a limitation because we rarely have sufficient funding to support um, what is needed. So to address these limitations in our current five-year funding cycle of the MU network, we are continuing to support replication studies of the programs and different subgroups of people with epilepsy to, again, continue to build the evidence. So for example, whereas hopscotch was originally um, tested among people with epilepsy in New England, who are predominantly white, hopscotch is now being tested in Georgia among African Americans with epilepsy. And the PACES team is adapting um, PACES for Spanish speakers and Hispanic adu adults and youth with epilepsy. SMART is being adapted for rural adults in the US Midwest. And we are continuing to evaluate um, English and Spanish versions of Project Uplift, um, as well as mindset in the states that you see listed. Uh, so CDC is also funding the MU network teams uh, to engage in dissemination uh, and implementation research systematically to examine factors associated with program adoption, feasibility of program implementation, and we're continuing to support provider trainings and workshops in partnership with the Epilepsy Foundation, the American Epilepsy Society, the Hopscotch Institute out of Dartmouth, as well as state agencies, as you saw. So um, what are some lessons learned from US studies on chronic disease self-management that can guide epilepsy work? We know that key reasons that people don't participate in self-management programs is that they simply don't know that these programs exist. They say that if they exist, you know, their doctors would have told them about them. The term self-management is um, a little awkward. It's unfamiliar, but once it's explained, you know, it makes sense to people. And um, we also have learned that primary care providers 
welcome information about community programs. And we know that um, provider recommendations remain critically important. For example, um, in a study of, of uh, people with arthritis, those who received a recommendation um, from their doctor to participate in an arthritis self-management program were 18 times more likely to go than those who didn't get a recommendation from their doctor. But we also know that um, this entire area is very complex. So despite having a robust self-management support structure in place in the US for diabetes self-management, um, including different uh, modes of delivery, along with the reimbursement structure that's in place, only about one out of two uh, adults with diabetes actually participate uh, or received, I should say, um, formal diabetes self-management education in 2017. So it's simply hard to move that population needle. All right, well, to wrap things up, what is needed uh, in the US to advance epilepsy self-management research and implementation? We need more research studies in different subgroups of people with epilepsy, whether it's by epilepsy type, uh, by different sociodemographic characteristics. We need more implementation studies on effective uh, patient recruitment and retention strategies. We need cost studies for payers. We need dissemination studies on effective ways to reach providers. We need more um, providers to refer patients or persons with epilepsy to these programs if they're available in their communities. And ideally, we would have national goals one day to promote epilepsy self-management uh, programs and to improve um, uh, population health. So um, I also just wanted to encourage you to visit our website for more information on each of these programs. We have resources for patients, including a self-management, a downloadable uh, self-management self-management checklist. Um, there are self-management strategies for patients. Again, there's a link to finding um, open new network program uh, uh, programs and communities. Um, providers can also uh, or Program adopters, rather, can uh, find downloadable one-page program briefs of each of the evidence-based programs that describes the program in detail um, and includes information on, uh, on contact information for each PI. And researchers can also um, download free self-management instruments and also find a list of our publications. So I had just wanted to um, also finish by acknowledging our fantastic uh, new network colleagues at, uh, at multiple universities that you see here and our partners with the Epilepsy Foundation and American Epilepsy Society, um, all of whom have made all of this work uh, uh, possible and um, we are so grateful to them. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rosemary, for a very, very comprehensive uh, assessment of the uh, program of work that the CDC is doing on, um, on self-management. Um, I'm now going to move over to uh, question and answer sessions. Um, can we uh, give access to the presenters? Um, Anne or Elizabeth? Okay, so let me uh, ask the first question. And the first question I want to, to give to Rosemary, and this is a, a question um, on the dissemination of self-management programs in epilepsy. Is there a difference between the uptake in epilepsy as opposed to those persons being offered a self-management program in uh, diabetes or asthma, et cetera? And if there is, why do you think there is? Sorry, God, who did you ask that question to? You just have Nuran. Rosemary. I asked that to, to Rosemary. Is she she's here? Not, no, she's not on the call. Okay. No, not on right. the yeah. Okay, so we can't answer that question. Rosemary, if you're on, if you're on this question, 
if you were here, that would have been a really good question to answer, and I apologize that you're not. So let's move on. Um, let's, let's start with Neuron. I, just tell me, right, if you were given the opportunity um, to devise an intervention program that would address many of the issues um, for people with epilepsy in Turkey, what would that look like? It's a difficult question because Turkey has a huge geographical region and with lots of different backgrounds, lots of different ethnic minorities. But for a general Turkish person, I first start with overprotection. It seems like um, not a problem, but it's a problem. And then I would like to tap the issue of knowledge. And then probably I would like to go to the issues related to marriage and the heritability of epilepsy, because lots of people still have issues about whether epilepsy is uh, heritable or not. So this should be the issue. And human issues, um, issues related with pregnancy. So I am greedy, as you can see. <laughs> I, I, ha I have lots of things to do with patients with epilepsy in Turkey, because we do know what to do, but we do not have the resources. So I envy your resources, Rosemary, uh, and also Liam's uh, resources because we are lack of it. So when I had the resources, I would like to do these issues specifically because stigma is something, yes, we do so, uh, patients with them suffer in Turkey, but it is something secondary, actually. Okay, so could you see, for example, in Turkey, uh, uh, if you had the resources, the adoption of the sort of programs that Liam uh, talked about and has operated and the ones that Rosemary have been suggesting, would that be welcome if, if, the, if there were resources that came with it? Yes, definitely. But of course, I need to do some cultural touches. Yeah. Definitely. But yes, I, I would like to do with the different centers in different parts of Turkey. Uh, with the contribution of neurologists and social workers. Uh, yes, I would like to do this, but of course, uh, there are huge cultural differences, as we can see from the results of stigma. So yes, I need to acknowledge them too, but um, I envy your resources, really. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rosemary, you, you weren't online, but there was a question for you, which was about the uptake of self-management programs, comparing epilepsy, for example, with diabetes or asthma. Do you think there is a difference and how can you explain that difference? Sure, and, and can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. And sorry, I apologize for that. I actually heard the question and I'm not sure, I just got briefly disconnected, so apologies. Um, so I would say, um, you know, a little bit of context. In the US, we have been supporting, well, let me clarify, the CDC and the NIH have partnered to support the diet, National Diabetes Education Program for over 20 years. So uh, in fact, probably about 30 years, and we have about 20 years of evidence on the National Diabetes Self-Management Program. Um, the same applies in terms of a, 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 a partnership between the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is part of NIH here in the U.S., NHLBI as we call it, who um, is a co-sponsor with CDC for the National Asthma Education Program and guidelines um, that CDC supports in communities. So we are um, essentially... Um, uh, newcomers to the self-management arena. Having said that, I mean, I do think that's an important context. So we don't have the data, obviously, to show um, even what good or what uptake is um, beyond our pilot studies. We don't have robust data to show what uh, how uptake is going in the U.S. compared to these other um, conditions. What I can tell you, though, based on um, you know what we do know uh, regarding at least diabetes and asthma, is, is that about uh, one out of two people with diabetes who are rec uh, who are uh, recommended to uh, participate in a self-management program participate. So um, not great, um, clearly, but um, not surprising. And I would venture to say that it's probably about this same for asthma, although probably a little bit higher for pediatric asthma. Um, 
So again, as I have shared, um, we are seeing relatively low uptake, um, even in our in our new programs and communities, and that is a problem. I mean, it's an unfortunate uh, problem because, as I said, it's hard to continue to for us, um, you know, to go back to our um, uh, to Congress to justify funding this type of work. Um, if we're just not reaching, if we're not effectively reaching um, people in the ways that we'd like to reach them. Can I be controversial and suggest that one of the issues might be that unlike uh, diabetes and unlike asthma, epilepsy is stigmatizing. And that might be one of the reasons that people don't want to participate is because they have still have difficulties coming to terms with their own condition? Um, you know, I, I think um, Gus and others certainly might weigh in. Um, I, I mean, I think that's uh, plausible on the one hand. I would say on the other hand, we at least uh, in, um, in our own efforts, we're very mindful of that of stigma as a barrier to participation. Um, as well as transportation restrictions, frankly, especially in the US. I mean, given, you know, our, unlike many parts of Europe uh, and elsewhere, we don't have good public transportation, certainly in our rural states and communities. So that is why even 20 years ago when we started this work, we decided to create programs that were delivered by phone. So that again, you know, at least we're eliminating potentially or limiting that um, uh, uh, um, barrier in terms of uh, stigma. You know, someone can just call up in the privacy and comfort of their home. Um, so I guess I'm not 100% sold. It's, you know, that stigma is a barrier. I would still attribute it to a lack of awareness, lack of understanding of the benefits of self-management and lack of provider recommendations for participation. So, so I just want one point and I'll, I'll come over to Liam about that specifically. So um, why aren't doctors recommending self-management programs? In the US? Hmm. I would say from, our experience talking with some providers, um, and no doubt as many of you know from your own experiences, um, many providers are, you know, they are sold or they don't even have to be sold. They get it, they, you know, they see the potential benefits um, and others simply want more evidence, that, you know, um, and they're not sold. But that's, that's been my experience in a nutshell. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, Liam, um, any thoughts about this discussion at the moment from your experience? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really interested. So, I mean, I think what, what Nuren said earlier about resources is key, but I think that's a complex thing. I mean, it took, even in a resource-rich country like the UK, where we, you know, the context is that we have a, you know, a national health system. So we've got a, you know, a kind of universal healthcare coverage that, with um, you know, have epilepsy nurses in most pediatric hospitals, etc. But it still took quite a lot of um, it took me about three years to raise the funds to do the PI study. Um, and the, the classic mental health funders in the UK weren't weren't too interested in it because they didn't really see it as a as a real mental health intervention. And we really struggled to kind of get buy in because this has gone back about ten years ago when I started this this off. And self and self management programs weren't really understood as a kind of valuable um, therapeutic tool. So I think that's slowly changing. But I do think we have to think, as as Nuren says, about you know what is the cultural context and what is the basic level of healthcare resource that can be uh, utilised in delivering interventions that might have been developed in different territories. You know, so for example, I could imagine that the, the PI intervention. Could easily be translated into Turkish, but then you know what is the context that Nurum would then have to work with in terms of having epilepsy nurses or psychologists. So I'm very interested in how and how we can. So what, what you know once we've developed an intervention like PI in a, a resource-rich country, it's no use if it's just sitting on the shelf or happening in a few tertiary centres in the UK. I would like to see it kind of um, delivered, you know, in as many countries as possible. 
we'd be very interested to hear from international partners who just wanted to look at the translation of that. They're welcome to use it. I appreciate some of it's not just about language, but, but the content's actually quite simple. So I, I think it could be quite easily used. So I think it's, it's you know, it's difficult um, without knowing, you know, what the actual basic level of healthcare resource is to think about how you can actually provide a useful, fairly straightforward intervention. But it is crucial. I mean, I'm, I'm convinced more than ever that, that it's all about early intervention. I think if we can alter the trajectory of these children's development, then this is the only way that we're going to see a significant um, decrease in the kind of problems that many of the speakers have described today in adulthood. So more should be done at an early stage. Um, I, are you there, uh, Devisha? No, she's not attending us. Okay, thank you. All right. So I wonder if I could um, just summarise. There, there is, there is no doubt about it that there isn't anybody on this panel would suggest that we need to intervene and we need to intervene appropriately for people with epilepsy if we want to address the psychosocial problems. And I still come back to this notion, if I saw a patient for the first time, a person with epilepsy, attending my clinic, I would want them, I would want to help them in order if I could alter the trajectory of their epilepsy. And I don't mean the seizures, I mean how they cope and adjust with that. I'd, I'd want them to know about what are the wider consequences of epilepsy and its treatment, the, the SUDEP, the, the, the risk of injury, um, the issues about pregnancy, the, the risks of anxiety and depression, uh, the challenges that they will have to face um, with, with having epilepsy in relation to their family, their friends and their relatives, and not placing it in the context of a, a significant major struggle, but allowing them to recognize that it's going to be a challenging journey, whoever they are, uh, unless their seizures are extremely well controlled very early. And I think the earlier we get in, the more likely we are able to provide people with the sort of support and services that they need. But Rosemary, you're saying that, you know, we're in the early stages of self-management. There's not the evidence that we need to convince everybody that's the right thing to do. Um, and if we, and, and you're in a, you know, a fairly uh, good environment in terms of, uh, the, of being able to be supported by the NHS and, and very large organisations like Epilepsy Federation, Epilepsy Society, and I'm, I'm thinking about then in neuron situation where there's there you know there is a little resources. How do we help her as an organisation make the sort of progress that you've been made in the US and the sort of programmes that she's seen that Liam run can can run out for children with epilepsy. I mean, this is a global pro program. This is a global problem, isn't it? Yes. Rosemary, please. Okay, sure. Yes. Um, well, I think um, it is a global problem. Um, it requires um, a strategic uh, planning and intervention, but I think we have models. And I, and I think of the mental health community and what's been done internationally um, for example, with respect to um, uh, training community health workers. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, what, what's being done internationally with integrate, training and integrating community health workers as, as community, um, as health care team members, um, uh, you know, is, is what's been done internationally as a model for the US. Again, we are now on track with getting uh, and training community health workers for diabetes management. Again, asthma management, we at CDC, just for so that folks know, we are also, we developed 
um, self-management curriculum for epilepsy to train community health workers, and that's available on our MU Network website. But my point is to come back to your question, Gus, and for colleagues like um, Nuren and others and uh, uh, who may you have um, uh, you know fewer resources, um, using though the existing resources and capacity that exists in countries like uh, trained uh, lay workers, community health workers, other um, integrating epilepsy self-management training as a component in training for public health students. We've, we've done that here in the US as well. Um, for medical students, creating a practicum opportunity, for example, for public health students or, or medical students to, to provide, you know, one of the, uh, a self-management program for an eight week or three month period. I mean, again, all of this would require a fair amount of planning, but it can be done. So I would just say that again, every location has strengths and it's a matter of starting from those strengths and building, the capa building from the capacity that exists. Thank you, thank you, Rosemary. Can I, um, I I'm aware uh, of the time and we, we've reached the end, but I just wanted to thank you for your presentations, which are helping the IBE consider about what steps we can make as an organization at a global level to help people independent of which country they live in. And uh, what you're telling us is that this is uh, going to be an uphill struggle, it's going to be a challenge, and it's going to be fun. So thank you very much for your presentations today, and, and thank you for the whole day. We've had a, a really interesting uh, uh, day, which uh, left me blown by the contributions that many have made uh, in, this, in this day. I'll hand over now to, I think, the President, Francesca Sofia. Hi, Gus. Uh, hi, everybody. I was listening uh, with, you know, a great joy and appreciation all that has been said that I think today is a milestone for the IBE. The IBE day was uh, a great success and the comments uh, uh, collected in the chat box and the Q&A um, chat uh, confirm. I think uh, we, um, we made it, uh, we really uh, were able to um, to provide you with information, contents, and contributions uh, that can be used. And that's what uh, the IBE is aiming for, for uh, to be useful and, be, um, and provide uh, the community of people with epilepsy and their families uh, with tools and solutions. Uh, as I said, for me today is a milestone and I am proud also for the IB team. Uh, I thank Gus, Lorraine, Mary, and the staff, and Little, and Elizabeth Cunningham for making a great IB day, and all you participants for attending throughout these three sessions and engaging with us. There will be more of this in the years to come. So thank you.